story has a happy ever after. And after this story, there's an after party. I think before before we do anything else, we uh we got to say um rest in peace to a a wonderful queen. I don't know if you heard the news or not. No, who? Chi Chi Devane passed away. Oh, what? How? Yeah. Um I actually just saw it before uh talking to you and I didn't see a cause yet i just like it flooded everywhere and it came from multiple sources um i guess i can probably check out right now oh shit pneumonia pneumonia yeah from uh covid uh i don't know it just says pneumonia she was 34 34 i know uh she was one of my favorites on rupaul's drag race and i was talking about this with somebody else a lot of my problems with mainstream drag came, like, I, I had a revelation of it this season when she mm-hmm. was in because of the way that she was, you know, criticized and, you know, with her, you know, coming from the background that she did and the obstacles that she faced. You know, when she says that she's a dollar store queen mm-hmm. and that was met with, like, that's not an excuse, it's mm-hmm. like, well, if the industry standard requires a pretty high cost of entry, then yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely an excuse. So, um, but in spite of all of that, uh, I loved her looks. I loved her performances. I loved her commentary. And I think I'm going to took, um, I think I'm going to cook some Turkey neck this week in her honor. Oh, she just had such a, like a lovely spirit. Mm-hmm. Damn it. Now I'm bummed. I know. And we have to talk about Once Upon a Time. Pour one out for Chi Chi. Yeah, I know. Chardonnay's ready. I have Miscotto. There we go. So, Both um... white wine queens today. We are. Uh, welcome back to Happy Ever After Party. I'm Sam Logsdon. I'm Amanda Pierce. And we, we finally decided to stop dragging our feet and talk about the bane of our existence. Yeah, uh, I mean. So, no. how far into season two are you? Um, I watched a couple episodes in, but mm-hmm. it was months ago now. Okay, so, so I remember very little. Okay, maybe um, four. I I watched up to four recently. I've seen the whole thing before, but upon rewatching it, I have like a general kind of um observation Mm -hmm. uh with season one we would have really good episodes and things that we really liked and we Mm -hmm. would have really bad episodes and what i've noticed so far with season two is that the episodes themselves more or less have a bunch of high and low points like it's not as consistent and the times where it shines is when they remember what worked in season one. We got so, a couple of shining moments in this episode, I would say. There were a couple that good I quips. Really enjoyed. Good quips in this episode. I'm really enjoying post-curse Prince Charming just a lot more than David before. Yeah. That's um that's one of the things and all like kind of piggybacking off of that. Whoever is in charge of choreography this season, or at least in these first couple of episodes, they've really stepped up their game. Like before the choreography was like, yeah, like it was like really mediocre and like clearly just like, um, I I don't know, Philip swinging his sword vaguely at a wraith was kind of pathetic. Um, this is for a later episode. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll, yeah, le- uh, I'll take that note and put a pin in it in yeah. my heart. Oh, that that was awful. Oh my god. I told Dennis I can't do that and when we were driving we down go. to Ma- when I was driving down to Maryland, I told Dennis I couldn't do that and he was like, "What? You can't do that?" No, I can't do the little pop thingy. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not that this episode 
it's not that the season is terrible. It's just that the the episodes fluctuate a lot. It's it's like last season tended to run hot and cold. Mm -hmm. And this one's a lot more lukewarm. Like every now and then it's like someone peed in the pool and you'll hit a warm patch. Mm -hmm. But most of the time you're just kind of like, this is fine. Like this This episode was fine. It was serviceable. And um, I do uh, preemptively before I get into it, I do owe people an apology because Mm -hmm. I was raging about this episode and I was going off of what I remembered reading previously, and there was a lot of things that I did not remember correctly. Okay. So I reread, and I want to apologize for any misinformation back then. And upon rereading it, and I'm glad I did, I learned a lot more badass information. So when we get to the thing that pisses me off, it still pisses me off, but for completely different reasons. Okay. I'll okay. allow it. Yes. Um. So. Season two, episode one, starts off in not Storybrooke with a person we don't know, presumably named Charlie, getting a message from a pigeon that is a um, postcard of Storybrooke with the word broken written on the back of it. Yeah, it has the clock on it. We do not hear from this person for quite a long time. I'm bringing it up now and dropping it. Also, it plays Lou Reed's uh, Charlie's Girl. And I'm like, ooh, Lou Reed. Yeah. So if you had your subtitles on or if you recognize that, then you can probably infer how he's connected. Lou Reed everything. has a pretty, uh, pretty distinctive voice. Yeah. I love Lou Reed. Yep. R.I.P. So, um, oh, man, lots of dead people in this episode. Is he dead? I think he's dead. I think he uh, is. He's too. probably spiritually dead. Yeah. So artistically. Um <laughs> uh in the um in the fairy sense, you know, there's not enough people clapping for him. Uh so <laughs> I do believe joke. in Lou Reed. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> um we are also introduced to people who we don't know mm-hmm. immediately after uh seeing the man presumably named Charlie. Mm-hmm. And Here's something that pisses me off about this show right off the bat, but we'll, I'll, I'll get to it in one second. Okay. So you know how in Once Upon a Time Season 1, we kept on having these flashbacks, you know, yeah. to yeah, the yeah. Enchanted Forest? Well, this episode is just the Enchanted Forest now. So a little bit interesting you have Techni- like your... technically a flash forward we find out at the end of this Te- episode. Yeah, technically a flash forward but not by much. Yeah. It's like a flash forward in terms of the episode but not in terms of like the rest of the story thus far. The, the it's a wraith, pretty interesting the setup. The wraith that enters in at the start of this episode is the one that leaves at the end of the of the episode. It's the same yeah. one. Yeah, so nice little Ouroboros, good storytelling, good job, guys. Yeah, it's um, fine. It's so an interesting structure, at least. We see Prince Philip awakening Princess Aurora with his bodyguard, who we don't know who they are right away. They have, like, a little chainmail thing. Also, we get a helicopter shot, and I go, ooh, this show has a little bit of a budget now. Mm-hmm. Season one must have done pretty well. <sighs> And I recognize the lady who plays Aurora. I believe it's Sarah Bulger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She played Princess Mary in one of my favorite trash TV shows, The Tudors. Awesome. She played Mary Tudor, Queen mm-hmm. Elizabeth's sister. So I was like, oh, good to see you in something else. Because I haven't seen her in much of anything else. Yeah. It's Sarah Bulger. Bulger? Bulger? Whatever. Mm. Anyway, good to see her. And I want her dress. Mm hmm. So uh, he he awakens his princess. A wraith appears. They fight wow. off the wraith. Uh, I'll harm you. Uh, I, I'm just trying to fast forward this as much as possible. Yep. Um, His bodyguard finally talks and Aurora, instead of like being grateful that she had two people there to rescue her, 
was like, who is this? The helmet comes off, and the bodyguard introduces herself as Mulan. You're a girl, a woman. Okay, cool. I see you, show. Yeah, so, um, am I surprised that Once Upon a Time went this route? Yeah. Absolutely not. Um, the, the show is kind of casually sexist, as we've established many, many times. Um, I'm not surprised in the least that this is how they introduce Mulan. Mm -hmm. Now, can I rant now, or would you like me to wait until we finish up this plot? You know, you know what? Do, do a Mulan rant. Go okay. ahead. So, before I even get to the Mulan bit... This mm -hmm. is very important because Disney has gone from having a show about fairy tales mm -hmm. in this world to exploiting its own franchises. Now, that may not sound like a big deal. And it's like, oh, OK, Mulan was taken from, you know, a completely different culture. And this is. Um, part of the Enchanted Forest that was left untouched. So it kind of makes sense that they would try to do something that was a little bit more removed from, you know, like Knights and Fairy Tales and stuff like that. So on a surface level, I get it. But here's where I have my problem. The inspiration for Mulan comes from two different places. One is from a ballad called... Um, the Ballad of Mulan or um, Hua Mulan fights in her father's place, I think is the full name of the ballad, which was written sometime between uh, 11 and 1200, somewhere between mm -hmm. those years. And this was sort of written how like um, Greek history plays were written, where they were a source of entertainment and education but over the years, what the history actually was kind of gets distorted over time. So there's a lot of speculation about, A, whether or not Hua Mulan actually existed. And if she did, are any of the stories true? Because historically, if you were a woman impersonating a soldier, yeah, you would have been executed. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's not disputed. Uh, when doing research, I was actually trying to find specific examples of women who were executed for doing this, and I couldn't uh, find any. Joan of Arc. In China. Oh, in China? In oh. China. No. no. If we want to go throughout the world, that is a very long list. Yeah. But, uh, like, specific examples of women in China who were caught doing that and uh, executed. I couldn't find any specific examples. But Hua Mulan got permission, according to the ballad, from both her mother and father— to fight in his place and in the original play um she ends up getting fairly high rank and being able to return to her family like with decent notoriety well, now it was essentially they find out she's a woman and it's either um like execute a high-ranking general and admit mm -hmm. they kind of have some egg on their face or just kind of let her go home <laughs> Sort of like it, here's where it gets murky because there's a lot of iterations of it mm -hmm. a lot. So there's one where um, the emperor ends up dying. OK, mm -hmm. but um, even though he falls, there's a lot of other people who are still alive because of Mulan's efforts. And uh, the emperor's mother offers her all this money and a very high rank. And Mulan declines and just asks for a camel. So her identity mm. is never revealed, but she just sort of like grace, graciously shows her way out. There is another one, and this is actually, I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but it's its just a wonderful sentiment where she is discovered. She, again, for being a high-ranking officer, they do not execute her. But when she's sent home to her family, they order her to become a concubine. And she's like, no, fuck you guys, and kills herself. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the iterations about Mulan. Now, I think that's the one I knew about. Yeah. Here's what's interesting. There's also another figure. Um, this is a real person uh, who fought against the Mongolians in the mid 1300s called Han E. And Han E 
also got permission to fight in place of a male person in her family, became such a high-ranking officer, was not discovered to be a woman until her superior asked her to be her son-in-law and she could not consummate the marriage. Nice. I know. That's great. And that happened. That was a real thing. So even though um, this wasn't um, Hua Mulan, it, it, it was like a real person who existed. So like the story of Mulan often gets tied in with Han e. And the fact that Disney did the Mulan cartoon movie, I love it. It's one mm -hmm. of my favorites. I like historical fiction. I like things that kind of bend the truth a little bit. That's not what I have a problem with. What I have a problem with is um, a show that's sole thing is we're going to take all of these people who you thought were fiction and surprise, surprise, they ended up being real. And they're taking the concept of Mulan and applying it here. And it just, it doesn't seem genuine because mm -hmm. there's such a, it's such a blurred line as to whether or not Hua Mulan was real in the first place. And there's definitely that influence of Han A in the first place. And not only that, the whole idea of a woman impersonating an officer potentially being executed, and a lot of women were, and like you said, Amanda, not just in China, mm -hmm. it kind of seems in bad taste to kind of just throw that kind of figure into a fantasy world for like a, the girl power points yeah it just like everything about it just feels slimy but if disney had to start anywhere with its um we're just going to use anything that you know we have our name on mm -hmm. this this was a fairly good place to start. So everything else that they kind of use in Once Upon a Time from here on out is not going to be as much of a slap in the face. Like if this didn't happen for another couple of seasons, I could see myself being a lot more angry. I'm more of the opinion that I'm glad to not see a white person in this show. If they're going to introduce someone new, I'm glad it's someone of a different culture and since a lot of fairy tales are folklore mixed with history, as we see in Ever After, for example, mm -hmm. um, I don't mind it too much. It doesn't... Appropriation is kind of the big word that I'm trying to beat around, but it doesn't seem like they're trying it's... to appropriate Chinese culture no, 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 in no, a way no. that's like, yikes. No, that's so. not what they're doing at all. It's it's even less about Chinese culture as much mm -hmm. as it is like really dancing around the fact that we don't know if this person was real or not. Well, we don't know if a lot of them were real or not. Like, not fairy tales. Like I'm talking about like from the actual source material of where Mulan comes from. Mm hmm. Like well, she's that's, a, that's she's not the a same folk as a fairy legend. Tale. Like it would be the same as if they introduced Paul Bunyan. No, no, it is not. That wasn't a real person necessarily either. It it wasn't a real person, but again, that's using American folklore. And Hua Mulan was not a folk legend before it was written down. It was written to be like a historical ballad. So it might have been myth, like um. It might have been mythologized over time, but her that doesn't first necessarily. Her mean first appearance is in a book, a fo folklore collective. It wasn't a folklore collective. I'm telling you, it was. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna wave my big dick of a Asian literature minor in your face. Okay, hit me. I want to be hit with it. I'm just saying, it was with her it, first. Mama. If her first appearance, as far as I know of, was sixth sixth century. In a ballad comp, or not a ballad compilation, like a folklore compilation of China. I think it was of Chinese women, but I'd have to like actually. So to my understanding, though, that ballad, like when you say like a folk legend, you're not just talking about like tall tales. You're talking about things that were presented to people that were in part inspired by history, not just mythology. So it's not like 
it's not like Paul Bunyan where it was very obviously a tall tale. Well, yeah, it would be. Uh, do you know Ave would, like that's why I brought up the Greeks, like because when they put yeah, on historic okay. plays, a lot of that stuff or like, you know what? Crap, I can't believe I'm going here. Uh, this isn't a real example, but it's based off of how the Chinese did ballads, the Fire Nation and Avatar in their plays. OK, a lot of that stuff. Yeah, highly exaggerated, but totally based on real events. And if that's the only thing that you're seeing, it's really hard to confirm the validity when you know that somewhere in there it's true. When when I think of Mulan's her heristacy, heristity, whatever that word is that I can't mm-hmm. think of right now, uh, the potential Historacy? of her as a real person. Mm-hmm. I think of um, I, do you know of Abe no Seme at all? Seme. That sounds really familiar. He was as far as we know, like a Japanese thing, kind of alchemist kind of mm-hmm. thing. But, and he actually was a real person, as far mm-hmm. as anyone knows. I think it was Heian, mm-hmm. um, the Heian era. Though I could be wrong, Japanese historians who know more than me don't at me. But he's been definitely mythologized as, think of kind of a Merlin figure. Yeah. Um... That's kind of how they sell him now is like a magician guy. He could be good, he could be evil, but yeah, Merlin would probably be another sort of equivalent. Um actually, speaking of Chinese, uh Lao Tzu Okay. would be a better example. Uh for those of you who don't know, Lao Tzu is the credited author of writing the Tao Te Ching, the source from which Taoism comes from, but don't read it. I actually it's like boring. the Tao Te Gene. I I do did I like it because I'm an absurdist and I get it. But uh <laughs> I hate Dow. <laughs> I love it. The, this is why me and Amanda are friends, is because we can have these kind of disagreements. It's but, all about uh, maintaining the status quo. It's such bullshit. Uh no, it's not though. Confucianism is worse. I was gonna say Confucianism is maintaining the status quo, and that's why a lot of these figures in poems and ballads over the years get blurred because Mm -hmm. the stories of them changed over time. And Lao Tzu got discredited from a lot of Taoist historians Mm -hmm. because from when the Tao Te Ching was written, there isn't a lot of information about him being real other than like third witness accounts. Mm -hmm. It's literally the Tao Te Ching and third witness accounts. And then once Confucianism took over, there's a lot of people saying, actually, this is who wrote it. And then another person would say, no, this is who wrote it. So and then communism came yeah. in and destroyed so, everything. So it's what, really hard to trace shit and find out what's accurate and original because, um, yeah, a lot of shit got burnt. <laughs> so the, the long people. and the short of it is, this isn't cultural appropriation, but when you're talking about Chinese and a lot of other Asian literature as opposed to European literature, Bless you. there's a lot of nuance. And I don't mm. think Once Upon a Time is like the greatest place to have the discussion of nuance. When I was thinking, when I was talking about appropriation, I was thinking of the Disney cartoon Mulan and how it's not Chinese so much as a blend of Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. It's yes. just kind of a pan Eastern Asian mix visually and thematically and i think if they had gone that route versus the kind of we're just gonna put milan in this world route uh it would have bothered me a lot more but they're like just that. kind of making her they could have called her anything and she yeah. would have still been whatever they could have called her literally any other name it, it actually no one would been... care I, I I kind of wish they would have kept her surname though, because that that would have been a lot more interesting for people to read into and see the similarities, mm-hmm. and it would just be another iteration of that story. You yeah, know? like because Hua Mulan changed it. so much over the years. I'm like this is just another telling of it. I'm glad they didn't. Frankly, I'm glad they didn't girl power another like Snow White. Like, they didn't make, I don't know what they do with Aurora, but they didn't make her, like, no, we're going to make Aurora actually this badass who fights. And I would well, rather see Mulan. Uh, don't, uh, don't ruin this for me. 
I'm not going to ruin it for you, but um, I, I think my only grievance is that I love Sleeping Beauty, like the mm. actual cartoon of it. Mm-hmm. And the thing about Aurora was that she she was somebody who grew up very sheltered. And the minute she realized that she was being sheltered, she started questioning everything around her, mm-hmm. you know? So even as far as like campy Disney shit goes, she did have a very interesting character. It wasn't the greatest, but you can kind of see it poking through a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm not blaming this actress. She is a fine actress, but instead of having like somebody who's genuinely intrigued about things and has good observation, uh, first couple of episodes, she is very clueless. Yeah, she kind of comes off as bitchy, and I hate that word, but she kind of comes off as whiny. The show made her that way so that there could be... Theme. No, I don't blame her actress. No, I don't blame <laughs> I any blame of the, the actress. I blame the writing, as always. I don't even blame... Uh, and I can't... You'd think by now I would remember her name. I don't blame the actress who plays Emma. Oh, um... Uh, ah, uh, um... Cameron. Yeah. From the house. Uh, I don't blame her, but they give her a lot of stupid pills this season. Yeah. She does a lot of things out of character. I liked her well enough, actually, in this episode. Everyone in this episode, I kind of like more. Maybe I just missed this show. Jennifer Morrison is Emma, the actress. Yeah, Jennifer Morrison does a good job, but like there, <sighs> I don't like her honestly. I don't. I have. I didn't like her in House much either. But you know, I like her I think better in this. I think your House bias might carry over a little bit, but that's not to say that I love her either. She you know? just always seems like she's mildly annoyed at everything. But let's go on with this episode because we got a little bit of a lot to cover. So all I, I said can is Mulan is hot. Summarize it. Yeah. Mulan is wonderful. And, and apparently um, they have ombre in this fairy tale world because her hair is definitely like highlighted or something at the end. Yeah. I'm like, uh, they have ombre in fairy tale world. Okay. So um, there is a wraith that appears and, um, you know, Mulan and Prince Philip fight it off. Aurora's kind of being a bitch about there being another woman around. And uh, it turns out, Prince Philip gets a mark on his hand Mm -hmm. from meeting the Wraith. Now, this is established in Storybrooke, and I'm just going to get through the Enchanted Forest bit first before we talk about Storybrooke. Not much happens. Not much happens. But uh, it's established that when you get the mark of the Wraith, the Wraith finds you and tries to steal your soul. Shire, Baggins, Harry Potter, the whole thing. Yeah. Um. Philip doesn't tell them that he gets bit by a zombie and doesn't tell the party. And um, when they go camping to try to go to the Haven. Oh, I guess we should mention this too. Um, I need to put a mark on Regina's morality tally chart for season two to see how evil she is. And my justification for this is that when she made the curse, She did not realize how far the curse would extend. She -hmm. was probably thinking it would only be her kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's not. Aw, I hear somebody mewing. What are you shouting at? Aw. Old man Mirez. Are you bitching about kids these days? Old man Mirez. Come here, buddy. Come here. I'll give you scritches. No. <laughs> Is he a good baby? He'll just, no, he'll just walk down the hall like I call I call him old man Mirrors because he'll walk down the hall just going meow, meow. He's Aww. talking about kids these days. So um my one cat does that too. Tybalt does that, but he'll just like start screaming in the hallway for no reason. And I just <laughs> go up to him and I'm like, Are you a screamy baby? And then he, like, stops real quick. Like, how dare you infantilize me? Ramirez, you're talking about kids? Hey, cute boy. 
Oh. He's so handsome. Oh. Ramirez he's, is handsome. He's the handsomest cat. Um. So, yeah, uh, Regina did a curse without knowing the full extent of it and may have potentially committed things like um, accidental genocide. Mm-hmm. So uh, our, I thought we were only counting not fantasy land Regina stuff. I thought we were only counting post curse stuff. <sighs> this is so. really th- it's 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 the day of curse. This is literally the line. OK, this is you wanna, the line. If you want to do it, you can do it. It's I fine. don't I don't want to, but it kind of opens up a new discussion about the extent of how bad things got Mm -hmm. so it's like if there is a line do we count the line itself i don't know these are deep questions for philosophers here's the thing is i'm going to put it on the chart but i'm going to put it in parentheses (laughs) so enter me she says in in parentheses. parentheses um so yeah, um Regina did the curse and when the curse happened, it we don't actually know what happened, which is kind of the weird thing right away. It Nor just, does like, Regina. Most, just, nobody knows what happened. The writers don't know what happened. The, the writers are like, Well fuck, we want to introduce new characters and we don't want everyone to go back to fantasy land. So we have to think up a thing. And What's they, the thing? Throw up my hands in frustration and be like, ah. It's vague, vague curse and uh, desolateness. Yeah. And so wraiths all of a sudden the, appear. The world, some people disappeared, but everyone, you find this out at the end of the episode, mm-hmm. but I don't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. Uh, Prince Philip gets the mark. He gets his soul sucked by the wraith. They put him on the bed that Aurora was on. And then they find what the uh, what the ending of the real world is. They find mm-hmm. in the fantasy world and say they brought the wraith here. Yes. So now, I'm not going to spoil that this second. We, we won't. But I am going to say that wraiths exist in this place, and they seem to be running running rampant anyway. With mm-hmm. or without that particular race. Well, they didn't say race. Uh, well, it seems to be a known thing. Maybe not running rampant, but yeah, it, it, it seems, seems to be a thing. Yeah, like this isn't that an we didn't anomaly. know about until this episode. Yeah, but, you know, we mm. the audience did not know this, but Mulan's kind of used to them. We and need she's... a new villain that's not Regina. So okay, fine. Well, that doesn't last long either. <laughs> well, um, so Mulan basically tells Aurora after Philip got his soul sucked out his face that some people disappeared, everyone else was frozen for twenty eight years, and then yeah. they woke up and there were wars before or after. I don't think she was very clear. And I, I don't think she was at all. Um, then Aurora wakes up and there's a safe haven place that they have to go to. Yeah. If you have any more questions, sit down. You do not have any more questions. This is all we know. <sighs> Regina yeah. thinks the other world is totally gone. Like, Rumple, I don't know what he thinks. Yeah, but... th- this is where we get into the weak sauce bit of of this episode. It starts off kind of promising, where, like, everybody's meeting up with each other, and they're rallying around Regina's house, demanding answers, and she's going to do something to them, but it turns oh, out... Oh, there's, there's an interesting bit. You don't know who Dr. Whale is. Oh, you know um, what? David asks him, who are you? And he's like... Uh, that's for me to know, basically. And or, actually, nobody else knows. Business. Yeah. Nobody knows, or at the very least, no one's bringing it up. Yeah. And you know what? I forgot who he is. And Dr. Whale <laughs> led the mob. Yeah. Oh, wait. That's actually one of the funny bits. Yeah, it in is. This episode. If you know who Dr. <laughs> Whale is. Um, yep. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't remember who Dr. Whale is. But um no, there was a really good line that uh Snow White says. 
And because uh, she, okay, um, I'm sorry if I'm pausing because like I just binge watched all of these episodes back to back, and I'm trying to remember what happened. Oh no! In the first one, no, you lost fell. your Moscato. It's empty. Oh okay. Um, so uh, put put yourself in the town shoes, okay? You know, um, you just got your memory back. Uh. Regina tried displaying her power and failed. There's oh, yeah, a lot that of was pretty funny. There, there's a lot of people who are running around confused, scared. Jim, Jiminy Cricket is offering free counseling because Lord knows he can't do anything else. He's kind of useless outside of that. And um, <laughs> Snow White is like, "Hey, Emma, I know we've talked before, but I want to like yeah, that was funny. talk about mother daughter stuff. You know, we talked about things we shouldn't have, like one night stands. And David's like, "What, Doctor Rail? What? We were cursed." Yeah, that was pretty funny. That 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 was funny. That was like the highlight of that episode. Hey, and, can um, you turn your shit down? We're recording. Dennis, turn your shit down. I actually can't pick it up. I can. Oh, okay. In my brain hole. Your brain hole? People are going to think I'm so mean to him all the time. I already know my mom does. She's like, why are you so mean to Dennis? And I'm like, I can't be all sweet and lovey-dovey all the time. And people will just be throwing up around me. I was going to say, I've been <sighs> your human punching bag for years. I'm glad it's gone to somebody else. He's not a human punching bag. He's a husband punching bag. And I don't actually punch him. I make him dinner and I treat him nice and stuff. But it's not in front of other people very often. Hey, Amanda. Huh? What did one husband say to the other? I don't Who know. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> that was for all of you Thumbtanic <laughs> fans out there. <laughs> What do you say to a husband with two black eyes? Nothing. You already told him twice. <laughs> Zenos, episode... don't judge me for that. <laughs> You're free to a home. Any home. It's not here. This Stupid episode cat. of Happy Ever After Party has been brought to you by domestic abuse for husbands and cats. <laughs> Domestic abuse. It's equal gender opportunity. And equal specious. So they try to kill Regina, and Regina tries to magic at them. It don't work, so they lock Regina up in the cell. Rumple Humple gives her the curse thingy on her hand, because he promised Belle he wouldn't kill her, but he didn't promise Belle that he wouldn't have a wraith killer. Exactly. Um, Still mincing no, words. Good listen, for you, Rumpel. Listen, the wraith comes, tries to suck Regina's face out, a la Harry Potter. They scare it away with fire. Um, and I then, can't remember. Does Disney have the rights to Harry Potter movies, right? Mm, no, that's Universal. Oh, okay. So they're like tiptoeing around the whole dimension. Yeah, thing. you know, it's it's a it's soul similar sucking enough. thingy. You can say a wraith. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. It's We're fine. fine. Chocolate doesn't make you feel better after, so it's not a huge deal. Um, so the thing's coming after Regina, and there's another good line from Charming that made me say, I like him a lot more now. He comes in with brooms, and he's <clears> like, for torches. I guess it's old fashioned, but so am I. And I'm yeah. like, oh, you have a personality a little bit now. That's cute. It's like they they gave him self awareness. And yeah. that's wonderful. It's kind of adorable. So he fights it off with a broom. Um, Regina tries to make Jefferson's hat work to send the wraith to another dimension so it'll stop hunting her. She and it cannot doesn't work. do the magic. Until Emma and, touches her. Yeah. And then it works. And it sucks the wraith in. And then it sucks Emma in. And Mary Margaret's like, I'm not losing her again. And then goes in after. And David tries to, too. But then he just face plants on the floor on top of the hat. It's funny. And 
what what else happens in this episode i'm kicking through this uh, because so basically it, it's an Ouroboros episode where aurora and mulan are like what did the wraith bring with it and they uncover a bunch of rubble emma and, and they find Margaret. emma and snow and they're like and they're that's like, what killed our prince yeah so wah, wah, wah. this I give this oh, a salt. What? Oh, hold on. Um, what are we uh, forgetting? Regina tries to kill David with bad CGI tree branches. Henry walks in and says he doesn't want anything to do with Regina until she gets Emma and Mary Margaret back. Um, and oh, cool. David said he's going to take care of Henry. And he says, I will find them. I will always find them. So there's a meme I share a lot. And yep. the source of the picture of that meme is coming up in just a few episodes. Yay! So even though that line is not said, I am going to share that meme again when that comes around. Oh, and there was a plot called a sack with Rumpel and Belle where they kind of break up for a second and then she comes back and he tries to send her away because he's still a monster. And she's like, but you see, that's why I have to stay. And I'm kind of brushing over it, but Emily de Ra- Raven and um, Robert Carlyle have, like, the best chemistry. They're the only relationship I care about. God damn it. It's adorable. And he's old enough to be her father, and I love it. And it's just so sweet. And apparently she, when she was kissing Robert Carlyle in one scene in this episode, she did bite his lip accidentally. Which I think is a natural reaction to making out with Robert Carlyle. I was going to say, accidentally. <laughs> I just think that's adorable that she admitted that. She's like, oh, yeah, I did that accidentally. Crap. Accidentally. Okay. Oh, my God. Like I calling up, up Robert it. Carlyle's wife. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Um, I just couldn't get over his rumple humple. <laughs> you know what? I... I would say that I give this a solid three, but I like it as an introduction better than season one's, if that makes I mean, sense. <laughs> I mean, season one's introduction was pretty Henry heavy. Yeah, and so, Henry was barely in this. Yeah, and he's clearly aged a decent amount between seasons, which I always love when they have kids in the show. Mm-hmm. And you're like, crap, your face is aged like three years. Crap, crap, crap. Just don't get any taller. They're like putting weights on top of his head to keep him short. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'd say probably two and a half, three is probably fair. Yeah, I like I it's don't not know if offensive, I can even say. But it's no. just, it was kind of a, like, literally, how I summed up what happened in the real world is all that happens in the real world part of this episode. Yeah, it it's you not You can literally engaging. sum it up in, like, three sentences and yeah. be done. And same thing with the fantasy world. It feels thin. Like, the, what happens in this episode is not substantial, but it's significant because it's going to tell you how once upon a time is going to keep going you know what? you know no, i'm gonna give it to because you know what the throwing up their hands at what happened to everyone else in the fantasy world is very frustrating and it doesn't get better they're like eh, this is, we'll figure it out don't ask questions like okay i'll tell you this right now episode two has a lot better quips in it and there's jane a lot writes it because jane writes it <laughs> But even Jane has a couple of things going on in that episode that frustrate the hell out of me. And the reason why it's good is because it mirrors everything that happens in season one. Mm -hmm. So it's not really telling us anything new necessarily, except for one bit of information. Okay. There's, There's like one kind of crucial thing that happens. In episode two, it's very competently told, but it isn't anything that we haven't seen before. But I will welcome her back with open arms. So our fantasy dinner party, she's still invited. Oh, yeah. I don't think she could do anything wrong at this point. We'll have have Jane 
we'll mm-hmm. have um, Regina. Mm-hmm. Lana Perilla. Lana Perilla. We'll, we'll have, have Robert, Robert Carlyle. Carlyle. And his and wife. we'll have Candace Thong. Yes! Oh, my God. I have a thing that I really want to do. Like, okay. really, really badly. Okay. For one of these seasons of Once Upon a Time, I'm going to label the episodes as our reviews of Once Upon a Time. Mm-hmm. But all we do is give, like, maybe about a minute or two of her general impression of it. Mm-hmm. And then talk about Deadly Women the rest of the time. I just had the realization when I turned you on to Deadly Women that I think I've seen just about every single episode of that show probably three times. You know what? I actually got really mad last night when I couldn't finish the um, Lizzie Borden episode. Oh, because it's, good, it's a good one. I know, because the, the, the special effects are great. They're not oh my God, great. They're bad. they're bad, but they're great. Um, I told Dennis that... Deadly Women is so good that it should have been made in 1994. Like, yes. It feels like if you told me that it was made in 1994, I would believe you. If yeah. it wasn't for the dates. The if it wasn't for is, the dates, I'd and, believe and the, you. And the picture clarity. It's not foggy enough like, not to be that old. But If you told me it was like a special Blu-ray release or something like that. Because I... Uh, Like, my my OCD that I have, like, I had to start with season one, episode one, Mm -hmm. and I'm not mad about it. I don't think I've watched all of season one, or maybe I have, I just haven't really gone back, because I don't know how much Candace is in it, and I watched that show for Candace. She's there. She's there right from the beginning. But you know what? Her makeup gets better every season. When when she gets her hair cut shorter, she Mm -hmm. becomes more of a scamp. Oh, I don't know. She was ruthless in the first episode. I know. She's fantastic. She's such a little scamp. I want her to read me. I want her to be my friend. I just want to sit in the mall with Candace DeLong and talk shit about people. Like, all day. We can get some tea or beer or wine or whatever Candace wants. I believe she's a wine fan. That's good. In fact, I think she's a Chardonnay fan. I mean, that's what I have right now. Could be wrong, though. You know what? Most of the time, she, if you like wine, you're not going to turn it down. Somebody at, I think it was CrimeCon mm-hmm. or IDCon or something, was asking her, like, what would you pair with an episode of Deadly Women? And she's like, oh, and it was a white wine, but I can't remember what. And I was like, Candace, you're a scamp, and I love you. <laughs> she's, I, I really want to, like, at her on Twitter, but I really don't want to scare her because she's a former FBI profiler and i was like this is someone who i don't really want to think like oh this girl's a crazy stalker but i really really want to be like at candace along i love you so much you're my favorite oh my god but Mm -hmm. i feel that's how i get on the lists let's let's plan for it not this season of once upon a time but like i don't know donate to our patreon so we can pay Candace yeah. long to talk to us or just like maybe next season we can give like two minute recaps of episodes and then talk about deadly women the entire time it let's just be what dreadful pennies becomes yeah it can be just a, a recap of a show that is like i, I mean the last, well, most recent season came out last year but it's had 13 seasons so what 2007 <laughs> Um, Deadly Women, if you're going to have any more, I can't count. Are, are they going to continue or are they done? I don't know, because last season ended last year and it was a short season. I think it was only nine episodes and there's been no word on a new episode since or a new season since then. Well, so damn. Candace, 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 I'm cheap. I, I am a professional voice actor. Ew, I will do things. Ew. It's not Candace's job. It's investigation discovery. But Candace, you have sway. Get on there. You bus. have so much power. You have blue eyes that can stare to the stare into the soul of even Ted Kaczynski. Like, come on, you can do this. Um, if I may. <clears throat> that was sexist. And it was true. I can that, totally that, do that. it. 
Um, no, what what was my favorite voiceover thing that I've heard so far? Because I, I kind of binge watched a few episodes of it last night. But I think the one we were watching. Um, cheese is not for cutting human flesh. It's made for cutting cheese. That's a pretty classic one. But that's not from Candy. Um, uh, I call her Candy because we're friends. Yeah. Uh, no, as far as like the VO goes, I think my favorite line was... Um, but could this straight-laced corset salesman commit murder? Yeah. That was I love, terrible. I love how they shoehorn the title in and the contempt with, the, with, with which the VO says it. It's, she did it for the money, honey. Oh, my God. It's like, it gives me hope. Look by title. Find deadly women, women episodes and be like, oh, that's a great title. I just want to hear that VO say it. And it's probably going to be a great episode. But. Mm-hmm. Two and a half to three apples for this episode. You know what? Let's just call it two. Let's call it two. Let's call it two. Fuck for Candace. throwing up their hands. Candace, you will find holes in this episode. I, Candy, Mr. Long, ma'am, don't watch Mommy. this one. Watch the Lizzie Borden episode of Deadly Women and then give me a call and we can talk about crime and stuff. Mm-hmm. I love you. I'm not huh. creepy. I'm not I- crazy. I love you too, Mommy Candace. I call her Candy because we're friends. Um, I, I call her Mommy because I'm not a brat. She's gotten me through so like so many sick days when I was in high school. I would just <laughs> sit and watch Deadly Women with my mom. It was great. Um, so it, it, we, we got to do this. You, you know what we say around here. Zinu, I'm are Sam, you going to sign off? I'm signing off. Up. I'm Sam Logsdon. I'm Amanda Pierce, and this is Xenu Pierce. And you know what we say. It's me out the end. It's me, me out, deadly women? But you are always meowcomed to this party. 